that might be me. <laughs> Hi right, to our one viewer. Uh, we're just waiting for a little bit more people to trickle in and then we'll start the presentation. Okay, hello everyone and uh, welcome to uh, this presentation titled Distant Lights Exploring Stellar Evolution. Uh, during this talk, we're gonna talk about the different stages in a, star, in a star's development, um, while also discussing the contributions of Latin Americans to the field of astronomy. Uh, normally we would operate the 20 inch telescope we have back here, um, but unfortunately uh, tonight the weather in Boulder is uh, subpar for astronomy, it's raining and uh, there's absolutely zero visibility. So uh, we'll still go through the uh, steps of what we would do to uh, take pictures and you'll get to see the telescope move around. And then we'll show you some actual pictures we've taken using the telescope. Um, but unfortunately, won't, you won't be able to actually use the telescope. Uh, so let's dive right in. Uh, my name is Luis Chavez. I'm a physics undergrad here at CU Boulder. Uh, I'm from Denver, Colorado, and I'm working with the Somers Bosch Observatory uh, to deliver these presentations. The Somers Bosch Observatory is uh, the main observatory here on, in Boulder. We have uh, two uh, of these 20 inch telescopes back here, and then we have a larger 24 inch telescope uh, that if you look at the observatory, it's the one under the big white dome. Um, and also my interests include mountain climbing, uh, like any Colorado native, uh, playing soccer and playing chess. And uh, I'll let uh, uh, my partner here, Connie, introduce herself too. Hello, um, I'm Constanza Tiburu. Uh, I'm a first year grad student here at CU. And I am mentoring Luis in this journey of creating this talk for you so you can enjoy it. Um, so yeah, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, and also uh, feel free at any point during the uh, during the presentation to type your uh, questions in the chat, and then we will answer them um, uh, at each at, at the end of each slide, pretty much. All right. So uh, the beginning of a star's uh, journey from birth to death is uh, in these objects called molecular clouds, and these uh, molecular clouds essentially function like a stellar nursery. Um, they're composed of uh, gas and dust, largely hydrogen, but also some smaller uh, amounts of trace elements, of heavier trace elements. Um, and these molecular clouds, uh, they exist all around the universe and uh, essentially every star uh, that exists came from these molecular clouds at some point. Um, eventually, uh, the forces of gravity begin to compress the material in these molecular uh, clouds into um, uh, essentially these spheres, these things called protostars. Uh, and here we can show you in the next slide. Sorry, never mind, not the next slide. Uh, um, yeah, so uh, these molecular clouds uh, compress all this gas and dust into these uh, points uh, that are called uh, protostars. And these protostars are encircled by swirling gas and dust, uh, this sort of disk that uh, revolves around the star. And um, uh, protostars are categorized as protostars because they haven't yet turned into stars. And, the thing that makes a star a star is when the process of fusion begins at the center of a star. And uh, normally here uh, is where we would operate the telescope to show you a molecular cloud. Um, but unfortunately, 
uh, because of the weather, we can't do that. So we will show you uh, that process right now. And so uh, this is the view. Oh. Yeah, this is the view of uh, the program we use here to operate the telescopes. And so essentially what we wanna do is we wanna find uh, a certain nebula. And here we already have the Eagle Nebula selected. Um, well, we'll go ahead and just type it again. You just find it by name or uh, some of them are uh, categorized by numbers. Like for instance, this one's a NGC 6611. Uh, you type that in and then it shows you where in the uh, sky it would be. Uh, and uh, very quick, um, this is the hemisphere. The green line would represent the, uh, the hemisphere we're in. And um, this orange line represents what you can actually view from the observatory. It's kind of uh, roughly drawn and uh, not a super accurate uh, approximation of what we can see, but it's more or less accurate. And so anything within this, we can, uh, we can view with the telescope for the most part. And so as we can see here, the Eagle Nebula is just within this orange uh, circle. So we'll go ahead and zoom into it. And here we can see the Eagle Nebula. And specifically, we wanna look at this area right here, which is which are, uh, they're known as the pillars of creation. They're a very famous uh, uh, molecular cloud feature uh, in the universe. There, there's a lot of pictures taken of them and there's a very famous Hubble Space Telescope uh, picture taken of them that we'll show a little bit later. Um, so once you have that, you wanna center it and then you wanna slew the telescope and you wanna make sure there's no one standing by the telescope because uh, it'll, it'll hit them and knock them over. So once we slew, we can see that the telescope slowly moves into position. Here we have uh, a red cover on it uh, just to protect the insides from any uh, dust falling in or anything like that. But normally we take that off and we wanna observe. And once it's slewed, we can see here this uh, purple frame around the nebula. And that's essentially what the uh, picture is gonna look like. It's where it's uh, the, the frame of the picture itself. And that uh, cannot be changed just because that's uh, how the camera takes the pictures. And so once we do that, we go to the camera tab here and uh, we, want this, we want to set the exposure a little bit higher because molecular clouds don't uh, emit as much uh, light as other objects. And some of them don't emit light at all. Uh, this one does emit, uh, emit a little bit of light because there's a lot of newborn stars within it. Um, uh, but still it's a, one of the dimmer uh, objects that we can observe. So we want to set the exposure time a little high. And so uh, about 30 seconds would work here. We want the binning to be at two, point, uh, two times uh, two, uh, the frame to be light and we go ahead and take a photo and then uh, we, we would have to wait 30 seconds here, but uh, since we're not gonna get anything anyways, uh, we can just show you uh, the, what the actual picture would look like. And so this is a picture we took a couple days ago of the pillars of creation uh, here at the CU Observatory. Um, this one I think is not as optimal because we try to colorize it. Uh, normally the pictures come out black and white, but if you take three different pictures in different filters of light, um, if we actually go back here, I'll show you what, the, what a filter is. If you go here to um, uh, the filter wheel, sorry, you can see all the different filters we can select. So there's a red filter, a green filter, an ultraviolet filter. Um, I think that's an infrared filter. And then these other three uh, that serve different purposes, but Essentially, you take three different pictures in, let's say, red, green, and ultraviolet, and then you stack the pictures together. Um, a student here on campus, actually, uh, a grad student wrote the code for it. And so uh, you, you put these three pictures into a program, and then it spits out a colored image. And so um, the picture back here on the slides is what it would look like in color. I think the, the black and white picture, actually, with high contrast, it showed up a lot clearer. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have that picture available. Um, and this is obviously the much more impressive picture uh, taken by the Hubble Space Telescope um, in 2014. Uh, you can see this newborn star here that is also visible in uh, this picture here. And um, yeah, obviously the Hubble Space Telescope has a lot of, uh, of advantages over a ground-based telescope. Uh, number one being it doesn't have to deal like weather uh, with weather like we do here. Um, also, there's less atmospheric effects. It could also take pictures uh, in, uh, at any time of day, uh, obviously, because there's no, uh, there's no daytime or nighttime in space. Um, so yeah, uh, it has a lot more. And it's also just larger in general. Our telescopes are only 20 inch. I forget how big exactly the, the Hubble Space Telescope is, but it allows, but it's a larger size allows it to take higher resolution pictures. And so, we have um, a few questions in the chat. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, 
Oh, I see. Okay. Um, topographical topographical elevation mask. Um, yeah. To be honest, I'm not entirely sure. Oh, I see. Uh, maybe you, I think you might be referring to uh, this orange circle. I don't actually think that's what it is because uh, it doesn't seem like it really follows the shape of the mountains. Maybe. Um, yeah, I'm not entirely sure how they decided to mark this because uh, I think someone here created it. Someone marked this at some point. I'm not entirely sure how they ended up doing that, but I think uh, you know the mountains aren't even I think as much of an issue as just like the the ceiling around the observatory here. Um, and the location based on RA and uh, declination. Yeah, let me see if I can pull up the. I'm not sure if we are sharing this screen. Oh, my bad. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, as you can see, the, the orange uh, circle doesn't really follow kind of how the mountains are here in Boulder. Um, so I don't think it's based off of any like, uh, like topographical uh, approximation. Um, and for the Eagle Nebula, the RA is uh, 18 hours, 18 minutes, and 48 seconds. And the declination is, oh, there it is, uh, uh, 13 degrees, 47 uh, minutes, and 50 seconds. Negative 13 degrees, uh, 47 minutes, and 50 seconds. And uh, thank you for the questions. Keep them coming. I think we have the last one. Can you also go into what oh, being right. um, camera? So the binning, I think, is, um, do you remember what the binning is? Uh, in what context is the measurement? Oh, OK. Mm. I'm guessing that's referring to, I'm sorry, I'm not an expert in telescopes. <laughs> um, I'm guessing that has to do with um, like the size of, what can I explain? Like the region you're taking from the sky? I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it also has to do with uh, how you save the pictures that are that are being taken. Um, yeah, I'm not entirely sure. We just know that uh, you always want to take it in two by two for the most part. But there's uh, probably other applications for the other uh, binning uh, frames or for the other binning um, dimensions. And the the frame is just um, so the bias, the dark, and the flat is uh, are, are forms of calibrating the telescope, and so. Uh, typically on an observation night, um, if you're doing like research and you want to take very clear pictures, you would take a bias, a dark and a flat uh, frame, and then um, you would input these into a program and then subtract it from your image. Um, uh, and then you would get uh, uh, a picture that has uh, like, for instance, the dark, uh, what you would do is cover the telescope like it is right now, then you would take a dark and it essentially just takes out any um, uh, oversaturated pixels uh, from the camera, and then you subtract those from your uh, from your uh, actual image, and then um, it just makes it so that uh, the image has a darker, uh, darker, uh, darker darks essentially. And uh, um, I believe the flat you take just pointed at something with a lot of light on it, and then so uh, it, it picks off the uh, the darker spots, and then so you eliminate that to get um, lighter lights in the picture, and then. Uh, I forget exactly what the bias is. I think the bias is when you take a picture really quick um, and uh, that takes out uh, some other element I, I, I forget about. But uh, yeah, overall, it just makes for a, a much more professional looking picture in the end. Um, now let's go back to the presentation here. And so after a... Um, after a star's, uh, after the gas and dust of a molecular cloud is compressed, as you can see over here in the top picture, um, kind of have this dispersion of, of cloud and dust, of clouds and dust. Uh, they're eventually compressed into a proto star with this sort of disk of revolving material around it. And then um, uh, eventually through the process of fusion, which I'll explain here in a bit, you end up with a newly formed star. And so what fusion is, uh, just to put it simply, is when two lighter elements combine to make a heavier element. So for instance, uh, at the center of our sun right now, uh, hydrogen is fusing to make helium and then helium fuses uh, in more complicated fusion processes to form even heavier elements. Uh, but the most simple uh, of these is just uh, hydrogen combining to make helium. And uh, along with the helium being created, you also end up with a lot of energy being released uh, as these uh, um, atoms uh, fuse together. And um, this energy being released is what uh, gives the sun its, uh, is, is what causes the sun to release uh, or any star to release such a large amount of heat and light um, and just energy in general. And um, 
th this, these forces of fusion are, uh, cause um, pressure to build up in the center of these stars as they heat up the particles around the core. Um, pressure builds and uh, it, it sort of wants to expel the, uh, the matter of the star out into space. And the energy uh, or the force combating this uh, is the force of gravity, which wants to compress all the material down uh, as much as it can. And so this balance between the forces of gravity and then the forces of pressure caused by fusion is what uh, creates, is what keeps a star from either collapsing or uh, exploding. Um, and we have some, oh yeah, thank you for clarifying, Rachel. And um, uh, here we'll talk about Guillermo Haro, who was a uh, who was a Mexican astronomer, or was a Mexican astronomer from the uh, National Autonomous University of Mexico, UNAM. And um, his research, or a part of his research, was um, in these newborn stars. Uh, he studied a lot of molecular molecular clouds and uh, the stars within them, and he found that um, as some of the material from the disk of, of gas and dust that revolves around the star, as some of it um, falls into the star. Uh, a small amount of it is accelerated around the axes of the star, around the poles of the star, and is ejected into space. And it's ejected at such a high speed that it collides with the surrounding molecular cloud and um, uh, lights up. It, it hits uh, the surrounding cloud and releases uh, energy and actually uh, leaves these long, bright beams. And these beams can stretch for uh, many light years away from the star, I think like two to three light years. So um, if we can imagine like our, our, um, our solar system, uh, as being, you know, a, a tiny fraction of a light year, uh, these light beams would go far, far beyond the, the boundaries of our solar system. And uh, these objects are known as herbic hero objects. They're named after Guillermo Haro and also his colleague, uh, George Herbig, who uh, they both kind of discovered the, the object uh, simultaneously. And this is a picture over here of, of the object uh, taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, this chart here uh, kind of shows the, or it makes a point of showing uh, what the next stage of, of the star is. And it's what's known as the main sequence of stars. So first off, this chart uh, shows the relationship between star brightness and temperature. Here at the bottom on the x-axis, we have the surface temperature with uh, the hotter temperatures being on the left and the lower temperatures being on the right. And then over here on the left, we have uh, uh, the surface brightness of stars or the uh, 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 absolute magnitude of the brightness of stars with the negative numbers actually being the, uh, the most bright objects in the sky and the, uh, the uh, larger positive numbers being the, um, uh, the, the dimmer objects in, in the sky. And so as we can see here, the, uh, as the color becomes more blue, uh, objects tend to become brighter, unless we're talking about very large stars, which are, are bright no matter what. And uh, as objects become redder, they're actually dimmer. Um, and so this band here that goes from sort of the, the bottom right all the way up to the top left is what's known as the main sequence. So this entire band here are, is uh, composed of main sequence stars and main sequence stars compose um, uh, the majority of stars in, in the galaxy. And uh, for instance, the sun right now is in its main sequence phase and uh, a main sequence uh, phase is char characterized by, uh, uh, I guess the most stable uh, stage in a star's development. It lasts several billion years. Well, oh, actually that's not necessarily true. There are more stable, uh, stages later, but um, I would say this is where the star uh, remains at a, a certain size while undergoing, while continuing to undergo uh, fusion. And it remains in this stage for several billion years. The sun's about halfway through its main sequence. Um, it's about, uh, I think the sun's about 4.5 billion years old. It'll stay, in its, uh, it'll, it'll stay in its main sequence until it's about 10 to 12 billion years old. And then after that, it'll uh, transition to the next stage, which we'll talk about here. Um, and then just uh, other features of this chart uh, I want to talk about is down here to the bottom right, all of these uh, smaller red stars are what, what are known as red dwarfs. And then stars uh, below this line are so dim that they're actually uh, called uh, brown dwarfs. They're, they're very tiny stars um, that are unable to undergo uh, hydrogen fusion. And so they let off a significantly less light than uh, the stars before it. Um, they are also known as failed stars yeah, because of that. <laughs> exactly. And so um, an astronomer who studies uh, brown dwarfs, um, uh, or one of, one of her topics of study is brown dwarfs, is Maria Teresa Ruiz, who is a uh, Chilean astronomer from the University of Chile. And um, one of her most famous discoveries is of this binary uh, dwarf system, binary uh, uh, star system called Kelu-1. And um, 
the reason this uh, discovery was so, uh, uh, I guess, uh, important in the, in the field of astronomy is that um, brown dwarfs are very visible to observe, uh, usually because they're so dim. And so um, typically when you observe a brown dwarf, maybe you would observe it uh, in, a, in a binary system with another uh, brighter star. But in this system, it, would, it was composed of two brown dwarfs so that both stars were very dim. In a system with a brighter star, you would see the brown dwarf pass in front of the bright star. And um, uh, you would actually be able to see the bright star dim for a second or for a while before, after, uh, before the, the brown dwarf moves away again. And so uh, this free floating uh, binary uh, system composed of two brown dwarfs was uh, uh, a very important discovery in astronomy for that reason. Um, okay, then we will move on here. Uh, let me just check the chat real quick. Yeah, brown dwarfs. Uh, I don't know if they're actually considered stars. I, I think that's why they're they're called fail st failed stars because they don't they aren't uh, big enough to undergo uh, fusion. Um, but yeah, I, I think you would just call them brown dwarfs and maybe not even categorize them as stars. Yeah, but definitely they are not like they are more massive than planets and less massive than like a main sequence stars like the sun. So yeah, I guess they are categorized as stars, but like that type dwarf stars mm -hmm. um okay and then we uh now let's take a look at this chart here which kind of shows the uh the evolution of the star and we'll focus uh i wanted to show this chart because it, sh it sort of shows this branching between stars in the main sequence uh, and so you can call uh one type of star an average star this would be a star about the size of the sun it would be about anywhere from half a solar mass that is half the, the size of the sun to eight times, to eight solar masses, eight times the size of the sun. And then after that, um, after the main sequence, uh, it evolves into uh, what's known as a red giant. And so a red giant is, um, uh, the red giant phase is uh, characterized by when uh, the core of a star um, uses up all, all of its hydrogen. And then so the fusion process begins to, um, continue further and further away from the star where you can find more hydrogen towards uh, closer to the surface of the star. And uh, as the forces of gravity aren't able to compress the material uh, as, it, uh, as it fuses farther and farther away from the core, it starts to expand the star and it starts to inflate the, the star like a balloon. And so stars can grow very, very large in a much shorter uh, period of time than their main sequence. So uh, for example, the sun in about 10 billion years, it'll, um, start its red giant phase. And then in about 2 billion years, it will expand uh, nearly to the orbit of earth. Scientists think that it's not gonna reach uh, the actual orbit of earth, but it's gonna get very near to the orbit of earth. And at that point in the future, the habitable zone, which we can see here as this green band, will be pushed all the way towards uh, Jupiter and Saturn. And so um, because Jupiter and Saturn have a lot of uh, moons with the necessary uh, uh, elements and, uh, and chemical, um, um, and, and, and compounds necessary for life. Uh, it's very possible that in the future, these stars will become uh, very viable candidates to develop life. But I mean, this is, you know, obviously very, very far into the future. I want to make a point that, so brown dwarfs are classified as substellar objects. <laughs> I just looked that up because I didn't remember the, the word, but it's substellar. So not, not a star. Almost a star. Almost a star, yeah. failed a star. <laughs> Um, okay, yeah, and um, uh, just to put the, the, the size of a red dwarf into context, um, when the sun reaches its maximum uh, size, it'll be 200 times its current diameter. So it, they grow uh, very, very large. Um, and after uh, the red giant phase, um, a star undergoes what's known as, uh, well, a, a red dwarf, a red giant, sorry, um, begins sort of, Oh, uh, sir, interesting laser. What is this question from the Jovian planet? I'm um, sorry, I'm just reading the, the questions here in the chat. Um, well, can I answer that? Yeah. <laughs> do you want to go ahead? <laughs> no, I think you know more about this than I do. Well, a Jovian planet, like Jovian planets are like Jupiter and Saturn, so the most massive ones in our solar system. And the thing that distinguishes between what's a planet and what's a star is nuclear fusion. fusion. So um, planets are not massive enough to, to trigger nuclear reactions. Um, so they, 
The thing is that they can't make, they don't have their own source of energy, so they don't shine by, by their own, I guess. Um, but stars do, and that makes the difference between jumping from being a planet to being a star. And in the case of brown dwarfs, they do have um, nuclear reactions, but not the fusion of uh, hydrogen into helium, like Luis just mentioned that happens in uh, main sequence stars. So that, that's what makes the difference, the, the mass and being able to uh, trigger nuclear reactions. Yeah, um, just to get into, I guess, a little bit of chemistry, um, uh, fusion can occur uh, that forms uh, just essentially different isotopes of, of hydrogen. So it wouldn't form heavier elements like helium, which release that massive amount of energy. It would, really, it would uh, undergo these fusion processes that form uh, things like deuterium, which is just hydrogen with like an additional neutron and things like that, um, which release a lot, a significant amount, uh, significantly less uh, energy as a result. And so then uh, we'll go to the, the, the uh, next phase of stellar evolution, which um, is when a red dwarf or a red giant begins to sort of let go of its layers, um, of its outermost layers. And the reason this happens is because um, the, the, the forces of, of gravity aren't enough to keep these layers uh, compressed. And so uh, the red giant just sort of uh, slowly sheds these layers out into space. And uh, it starts with like the its outermost layers, which are largely composed of, of a hydrogen, and then it begins shedding its helium layers that it's accumulated uh, closer to its core. And then eventually, um, it just leaves behind this core of, of uh, carbon and oxygen known as a white dwarf. So here in these pictures, we can see these sort of layers of, of um, material that have been shed by the star. And here at the very center is the white dwarf left behind. Over here, we can kind of see this too. This one's a little bit more dispersed. You can't see the layers as, as clear. Um, but you can kind of differentiate between the different uh, elements a little bit. Uh, if you're in, into like astrochemistry, you might study the composition of these, uh, what, what are called planetary nebulas. These are called planetary nebulas. And you can kind of see what elements the star formed or uh, well, just what elements it was composed of. And so then uh, here we, would, uh, we were gonna try and take a picture of a, of a planetary nebula. Uh, one of the more famous planetary nebulas is called the ring nebula. Um, but unfortunately that is also, also not gonna happen. So uh, we'll just show you the process here. So the one we wanted to look at is called the ring nebula. Uh, center. Okay, there it is. And um, just to answer any questions, the uh, RA is uh, 18 hours, 53 minutes and uh, 35.1 seconds. And the declination is uh, 33 degrees, uh, one minute and 47 seconds. And so this is what the ring nebula uh, kind of looks like. Uh, here's the little white dwarf in its center and we will try and take a picture of this one. And so since this one I think is a little bit brighter, um, I'm not entirely sure why, but I think we use this a lower exposure time. So I think maybe we would use like five seconds here. Um, same binning, same frame. Um, we would also probably want to take three different um, uh, filter uh, pictures so we can just get like all these really cool colors and then um, it would just take the photo it would take five seconds and then um, here we'll actually show you what pops up afterwards um here we go uh, is that actually showing up let me check Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So this is just obviously a picture of the inside of the cover of the telescope and you can see like all these. Did we move the telescope? Uh, yeah, I think. Okay. Did I slow it actually? Yeah. Well, maybe not actually. <laughs> yeah, I'll slow that real quick. Here we can just see the uh, telescope pointing to, to where the ring nebula would be in the sky. And um, the telescope actually moves as the, as the sky, as the earth rotates, it, it slowly moves to, to compensate for that. So um, it tracks objects in the sky. And so this one's, it's almost pointing directly up. And um, you, here you can see why we take um, the calibration frames. It's to get rid of all this additional noise, all these little white pixels, these uh, weird donut shaped objects, these uh, sort of darker edges. You take all of those uh, calibration frames and then you remove all this noise and then you end up with a much clearer picture overall. Um, and then here is what a picture we took of uh, recently of, of the ring nebula looks like. 
And this one's actually came out, I think, a lot better than the than the Pillars of Creation because uh, just the, the colored version came out really, really nice. You can actually see all the different colors. You can see the white dwarf in the middle. Um, yeah, this is a, this is a really good picture. And then here's uh, the Hubble Space Telescope picture, uh, which is just you know obviously a lot clearer. Uh, the white dwarf here looks a lot uh, smaller. I think they, I don't know what they did to um, stop the, the uh, stop stars from um, leaving such a um, I don't know what I would call it like a, a larger larger shine like in this picture. Oops, whoops, whoops, whoops. How do I go back? <laughs> no. Yeah, just how the, how the stars look a lot uh, brighter and larger here. They they made them a little bit more um, pinpoint sized. Um, okay, and just a quick, uh, if anyone has any questions, we can uh, talk about them here. This is just uh, several uh, pictures of a star undergoing um, it's it's uh, of a red giant undergoing its its uh, death phase. Um, and you can see it just shedding off its layers, and then eventually these layers just form a planetary nebula. I think we don't have more questions so far. Okay, yeah, no more questions. We will move on, and I'll, I'll stop if I see any questions later on. Okay, and uh, uh, this astronomer, Sylvia Torres Painbert, um, uh, a Mexican astronomer from the, also from the National Autonomous University of Mexico, um, specializes a lot in, in the study of, of the chemical composition of nebula. So she actually, uh, she does what's called a, a spec, a spectroscopy, which is um, uh, looking at the light that passes through these nebula and then, uh, because uh, each element uh, has a different um, uh, spectrum to it, uh, it's got a, it looks different. Um, the light of it is different colors, essentially. Um, you can look at these uh, these uh, sort of blueprints of light and then determine what uh, element it's made out of or, or what compound it's made of and things like that. And so um, that's how we can tell that, uh, for instance, most molecular clouds are um, um, composed of hydrogen. And then uh, we could also look at like other elements that have, may have come off of like uh, a star's uh, uh, planetary nebula. So for instance, there might be a little bit more helium than in a normal uh, molecular cloud, or there might be um, maybe like nitrogen or heavier elements like that. And then uh, we'll return back to this chart because now we're gonna look at um, the bottom branch here where there's much larger stars. Uh, usually when we're talking about these stars, we're talking about stars between eight to 30 solar masses. So stars much larger than the sun. And these stars, once they end their main sequence phase, they uh, transition to the phase of uh, being a red supergiant. And red supergiants, uh, the only difference between a red supergiant and a red giant is that it's just much, much larger than a red giant. Uh, and additionally, uh, because the star is larger, it undergoes, it can undergo a fusion of much heavier elements. So for instance, where um, red giants, usually the fusion process stops at around uh, carbon or oxygen. The red supergiant process continues all the way up to uh, iron, and so they start developing this very dense iron core. Um, and when that uh, iron core grows too big, the forces of gravity again aren't able to sustain, uh, aren't able to, to keep the star together, and um, it transitions to a, a, a different phase here that we'll explore in a bit. And here's just a comparison of the size of uh, Betelgeuse and Antares, which are red supergiants, compared to. Here you can see at the very bottom, uh, just a tiny little like, pixel sized object is the sun. And uh, Aldebaran is a red giant. So that's what the sun would look like at its, at, at its maximum size. And so as you can see, it's still much, much smaller than Betelgeuse and Antares. And um, their star is even bigger than, than these that exist out there. And these are known as hypergiants. There's just uh, much uh, more classifications of stars we can go into, but uh, we're just trying to keep it a little bit more basic. Um, and so after, a, um, a star, a, a red supergiant's core uh, uh, is, is, uh, of iron becomes too large um, and the uh, forces of gravity aren't able to keep, it, to keep it together. It sheds all of its layers at once in a very violent explosion uh, that's known as a supernova. And um, as you can see here on the left, um, a supernova is actually so bright that uh, it, it can, you, you can see it shine almost as bright as, as a galactic uh, center. Uh, here on the right, you can see uh, the remnant of a supernova. It also leaves behind uh, a nebula known as the supernova remnant. And um, the interesting thing about supernovas, other than just you know the explosive element of it, is that a uh, um, uh, spontaneous fusion occurs at the moment of a supernova. And so elements heavier than iron are formed during a supernova. So uh, for instance, a lot of the, 
the heavier elements that we find here on Earth, um, gold, silver, uranium, all of those were formed during a supernova. And so at some point in the past, uh, a lot of the things that were here on Earth came from some supernova somewhere. And then uh, here we see uh, the star Betelgeuse, which is kind of forms like the shoulder of the, of the star of the uh, constellation Orion. And then here on the right is sort of a, a picture of what it would look like uh, if it exploded or if it un underwent a supernova, which um, scientists predict is going to be sometime in the next like 100,000 to a million years. And uh, when, it, uh, when it goes into a supernova, it's going to be so bright that it'll be visible during the day uh, for weeks. And um, I think actually like, you know, there's been various supernovas that have exploded in, in, the, in the past throughout history. And uh, uh, it's just interesting to see like what the different cultures have kind of uh, thought about, like what they are. You know, they're just such crazy bright objects that they just outshine uh, even some of the brightest uh, objects in the night sky. Can I mention something? Yeah. <laughs> that very recently um, astronomers were, there was like a, a big controversy about around Betelgeuse because it started, started to display like um, variations in its luminosity. So they thought that they, uh, it was close to explode maybe, <laughs> but at the end, not, nothing happened. <laughs> oh, so it, maybe it's not as close to exploding as they thought? I mean, close in astronomical time scales, <laughs> yeah, so like, but not human time scales, I guess. Like millions of years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it probably won't happen during our lifetimes, but um, uh, if it did, it would look pretty impressive. I think um, there's, there's one supernova called uh, Kepler supernova. Um, that exploded like in the year 1600 and uh it was observed by kepler and uh that one was uh really bright i think it shined for several weeks and you could see it during the daytime also and um uh, this scientist is named Mar mario hamui uh, he's a chilean astronomer who uh specializes in the study of supernova and what he did is he actually created a catalog of supernovas and he um uh uh what, what he did is he, he studied the changing luminosity of supernovas since uh, supernovas change in luminosity so quick. Uh, you could actually uh, look at the changing luminosity. Oh, uh, we have a question here in the chat. I'll, I'll answer that right after this slide. Um, and uh, what looking at the changing luminosity of supernova does is it allows you to approximate uh, distance more accurately. And um, with distance approxima approximation, you can actually estimate the rate of expansion of the universe. And so um, through his work and then uh, various other astronomers that have kind of done uh, similar distance uh, or cosmic measurement um, investigations, uh, we, we were, were able to see at what rate the universe is expanding. Here on the right, we can see that the universe is actually accelerating. Uh, the, the rate of the expansion of the universe is accelerating. So it's growing. Um, it, it's, uh, everything's moving farther and farther away from each other as time goes on uh, at a faster speed. And then to answer the question in the chat, are planetary nebula, protostellar nebula, and uh, supernova remnants all mutually exclusive? Um, I would say yes. Uh, planetary nebula, um, you can actually look at the chemical composition of each one and see that they all contain different elements. Planetary nebula are formed um, after the death of a red giant. And so it's just the layers of a red giant being sort of just shed off one by one. Uh, protostellar nebula or uh, the molecular clouds in which um, stars are formed are um, you know, mostly made of, of hydrogen with maybe like some other trace elements that come from maybe some past supernovas or past uh, planetary nebulas, but largely, uh, I think uh, almost all molecular clouds are large form or are, um, are formed largely of, of hydrogen. Uh, planetary nebulae, they contain like some heavier elements um, like helium, uh, boron, uh, things like that, things um, all the way up to just before carbon and oxygen. And then uh, supernova remnants contain uh, pretty much any, any heavier element that's stable uh, on the periodic table, all the way up to um, when elements just start uh, decomposing uh, instantaneously. You know, things like uh, plutonium probably won't, won't exist in big quantities in these uh, supernova remnants, but you'd be able to see gold traces, silver traces, uranium, maybe uh, a little bit of uranium and things like that. Um, um, can I yeah. add something to that? That I guess it's important to mention that um, all this stellar evolution process is like a recycling process. So once the star explodes, um, all that material that was inside the star goes into the interstellar medium. And then that same material will be reused 
to create uh, like, like the next generation of stars. So while these events are, I mean, while planetary nebula and supernova remnants, supernova explosion, sorry, um, are exclusive, are different events, like all the material released in those explosions is reused um, to create new stars. So um, the protostellar nebula uh, in the question um, would take all that material and use it to create new stars. <laughs> oh. I think it's worth to mention that. No, yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, okay. And um, we kind of already had a question time, but here's um, a little time lapse, or I guess like a like a simulation of what the uh, Crab Nebula looked like when it exploded. Um, you can kind of see what it. I'll, I'll show you the picture again of, of what it looks like when it's uh, standing still. But it was over here. Um, you can see that you know supernovas happen in such a short time and expanse is, is so large because all the material is expelled at uh, near light speed. I could add maybe another comment about Mario Hamui. Yeah. Um, so he and Jose Massa, who is a diff uh, another uh, Chilean astronomer, um, they created this catalog of supernovas and uh, that helped the research of the astronomers who actually got the, like, uh, like who earned the recognition of the, for the discovery of the accelerated ex uh, accelerated expansion of the universe. So uh, Mario Amui and Jose Massa contributed to that. So that's why the research was so important. Yeah, for sure. And then, um, so the next phase after a, um, uh, after a uh, supernova, um, uh, a, a very dense core is left behind at the very center of the supernova. And this uh, core is essentially only composed of neutrons uh, because all, all the protons were essentially just expelled out into space during the explosion. And um, this uh, core of neutrons is just named a, a neutron star. And neutron stars are, are very, very interesting objects because uh, they're so dense that if you filled a coffee, a coffee cup with the material from a neutron star, it would weigh more than Mount Everest. So it's just a tremendous amount of, of, ma of matter uh, compressed to like a very small amount. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, neutron stars have typically around the mass of the sun, maybe one or two times larger than the sun, but compressed into um, uh, the, a size of about uh, the size of Manhattan. So like a couple miles in, in diameter, they're very, very small objects. And uh, the question in chat is um, in reference to uh, a supernova, you'd have an inc uh, increasing um, me metallicity of the stars because there's no stellar process that produces hydrogen from heavier elements. Um, yeah, that's true. But hydrogen is so abundant in the universe uh, that still stars will, are continuing to be created out of that. And then uh, a lot of the material from uh, supernovas isn't just put back into stars. It's made into, you know, uh, asteroids and comets and planets and things like that. Uh, and so uh, for the most part, stars will still be produced um, uh, mostly out of hydrogen, but uh, yeah, they'll have some of these other elements within them uh, kind of uh, just surpassing the, the, uh, that process. And that's kind of why, um, um, well, actually, I, I won't say the next part because I'm not sure it's it, correct. But, um, uh, I guess yeah. I would maybe add that the amount of um, chemical elements fused in massive stars, um, I guess is not enough compared to the abundance of hydrogen and helium in the universe. Uh, because when massive stars start to um, fuse uh, heavier chemical elements in their cores, that happens in a smaller and a smaller region of the star. So I would say that the amount, I don't, I don't have idea about the right, like the, the exact number, but um, I would say that the amount of chemical, like heavier chemical elements produced in their course uh, is not comparable to, to the abundance of hydrogen and helium, which are the latest chemical elements. Yeah. And also, I mean, if a star um, uh, doesn't have enough hydrogen to start the fusion process, then it wouldn't be a star. So 
Um, uh, I probably, there's maybe some stars out there with a lot of uh, metals in it that are just were never able to, or, or non-stars that were, weren't able to start the fusion process. And so they just never became stars. Um, oh, my bad, we're still on this slide. Uh, yeah, so the neutron stars, uh, very dense and very small objects. And um, they take on some very interesting forms. So uh, some neutron stars uh, expel material from their poles uh, in very uh, long, uh, I guess, uh, very, very long beams of, of energy is expelled from their poles, um, kind of through the same process that uh, uh, happened in, in the, uh, in the uh, stars forming in the molecular, molecular clouds with the herbic hero objects. And because uh, neutron stars rotate so quickly, the slowest neutron stars uh, rotate at a speed of uh, about once every 12 seconds, while the fastest neutron stars rotate you know, hundreds of times a second. Thousands of times. Thousands of times, <laughs> yeah, maybe even. <laughs> um, these beams of light are sort of uh, are kind of like swept along really, really quickly rotated around. And so scientists can uh, find these neutron stars or these, uh, what they're called, they're called pulsars, these uh, neutron stars with the beams coming out of them. Um, and they're called pulsars because they, you can actually see little pulses of light uh, if, you're, if you're looking in the right areas. Um, and so, uh, uh, that's, that's how you find pulsars is you just look for these little blinks of light coming from these beams coming off of them. And they're actually so precise that, uh, um, that you can actually use them to track time more accurately than anything we have on earth. They're, they're so precise in the rotations. Um, uh, you can, you can use it as like a sort of uh, cosmic time measurement. Yeah. You can also use it, uh, use them as maps in the universe because each pulsar has like a very specific period of rotation. So have you heard about the golden record in the Voyager? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the golden record has like a lot of information about the human race. <laughs> and one of those uh, points, I guess, of information is that they have the location of the Earth with respect to 14 pulsars. Uh -huh. Because, wow. well, if anyone can like actually measure the period of those pulsars, um, they could actually locate the, earth. <laughs> the location of the earth, which is, could be scary, but well, yeah, if there's we, we gotta meet our, there. meet our neighbors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then another form of a proton star or a neutron star exists where um, uh, they have unusually strong magnetic fields. And uh, we're talking about several million times uh, the strength of the sun's magnetic field. And these are known as magnetars. And magnetar, the magnetic fields of magnetars are so strong that if you were to approach one, um, your atoms would be literally pulled apart and uh, you would dissolve, essentially. Uh, yeah, just, uh, I don't know, maybe not that painful of a way to go. Who knows? Before we move on from neutron stars, um, I also would like to mention that neutron stars are the most extreme observable objects in the universe, because the most extreme ones are <laughs> black holes, yeah. which we are going to talk about. But a neutron star is very similar to a black hole, but the difference is that you can actually observe a neutron star. Um, they emit light. Directly. Directly. Yeah. And the other thing I, I want to say is that um, the density of a neutron star is so extreme that it's actually denser than the nucleus of an atom. So, here on the earth in our laboratories we cannot actually reproduce those conditions of density so neutron stars are the only place in the universe where you can study um that extreme dense conditions of matter so wow. they're very unique <laughs> yeah hopefully we'll be able to st study them a little bit closer but uh yeah i think marcel is right we're getting close to a, a neutron star still sounds better than falling in a black hole <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Of course. Um, and then here's a, a really cool phenomenon that happens when two uh, uh, neutron stars are in a binary system together. So where the binary system is just composed of uh, both, the, both the stars being uh, neutron stars. And so as they orbit each other, their uh, gravitational force uh, is so strong that they actually emit these gravitational waves. And uh, gravitational waves actually happen in any binary star system, but here they're, they're very noticeable because uh, of the uh, extreme density of the neutron stars. And these uh, waves are detectable for you know uh, millions of light years away from these systems. And actually, here on Earth, uh, 
uh, we detect gravi gravitational waves relatively recently that kind of confirmed uh, uh, part of Einstein's uh, uh, theories. Um, and uh, it, it came from a system like this composed of two neutron stars. And uh, uh, what gravitational waves are, it's uh, just literally regions of varying gravity uh, in, in the space-time fabric. And so you would have like one constant of gravity here and then immediately after a, a lower constant of gravity and then a higher one, lower one. Uh, very interesting thing to study in physics and uh, astronomy. And then here, uh, what I think are the most uh, uh, mysterious and interesting objects in the universe, because like Connie said, you can't observe them directly, mm -hmm. um, are black holes. And uh, black holes happen when a uh, red supergiant larger than 20 solar masses explodes. And so anything lower than 20 masses, uh, that's still a red supergiant, uh, results in a uh, neutron star, whereas uh, red supergiants larger than 20 solar masses uh, result in a black hole. And what a black hole is, is uh, uh, just a literal rupture in the space-time fabric. So as you can see here on the right, uh, the space-time fabric is sort of, uh, we can think of it like, like a, this is, uh, uh, like a like a piece of rubber stretched, and then um, objects on it kind of leave sort of like a dent in the in the in the uh, rubber. And so, like let's say you put a metal ball on the rubber, it would kind of stretch down a little bit. That's kind of what our sun does. But a black hole is a tear in the rubber, and so um, the gravitational pull of black of a black hole is so strong that nothing can escape it. Uh, not even light. Light is the fastest thing in the universe. So if if that can't escape it, uh, nothing can. And um, black holes are. Uh, aren't directly observable because they are black. They they uh, um, they uh, absorb all the light that goes into them and don't emit anything. But uh, some of the black holes kind of have this uh, disk around them, uh, and uh, because the disk uh, this this disk of gas around them, gas and dust, and uh, because the disk uh, rotates so fast around the black hole because of their uh, immense gravitational pull, uh, a lot of it is superheated, and so it leaves behind sort of like this ring of a bright material. And then so uh, relatively recently, I forget what the year was, 2019, 2020 maybe? Yeah, uh, we uh, indirectly observed the first black hole, the M87 black hole, uh, which you might've seen in the news is a very, uh, uh, very significant um, picture that was taken, very significant discovery. And um, black holes are some of the most uh, long or they are the most long living objects in the universe so long after uh, all the stars are gone because of uh material has spread out too much uh, black holes will still exist and they'll slowly evaporate away material um through a phenomenon that's known as hawking radiation discovered by stephen hawking uh and so eventually even uh black holes will evaporate away but that will take you know we're talking millions or you know billions and billions and billions of times uh, more than the current age of the universe so uh, there's been no uh, black hole uh, uh, evaporations right now that are, are, I guess, large black hole evaporations. Maybe smaller black holes have ev evaporated away in laboratories and things like that. Who knows? But um, um, yeah, that's what black holes are. And um, the M87 black hole is actually uh, not a normal black hole. It's a supermassive black hole. And supermassive black holes don't uh, aren't formed through conventional means, like through the explosion of a, a, su a red supergiant. They form when two uh, galaxies collide with each other and then their, their center forms supermassive black holes. And so our galaxy right now uh, is believed to have a supermassive uh, black hole at the center of it. And then uh, just the last question time here, and then this shows uh, kind of what Marcel was talking about that uh, getting close to a black hole results in spaghettification where uh, the pull on uh, the gravitational pull on your feet is much more than the, the pull closer to your head. And so you're just stretched out as you get close to a black hole. And yeah, a uh, very painful way to die, I assume. <laughs> yeah, I guess um, the origin of supermassive black holes is, is not really clear. And it's actually a, an active area of research right now because no one really knows how you can form a so, so massive object. And one of those uh, possible explanation is uh, the collision of two galaxies. But, but those two galaxies already have supermassive black holes. So it's, you know, a mystery yeah, <laughs> nowadays. Yeah, anything, anything to do with black holes is uh, just the topics of is a topic of uh, ongoing research right now. Um, yeah, so if you're into physics or astronomy or astrophysics, um, and you want to study things like that, uh, for sure, look into it. 
And that is the end of our presentation. Um, thank you all for coming. And uh, if you guys want to look at the uh, telescopes up close and then actually look through the teles uh, telescopes, we have eyepieces on them. And then we turn them to a different setting. So you could just look through them and then actually look at uh, planets and maybe nebula, star clusters, things like that with your, uh, with your own eyes. Um, usually we get uh, on a clear night, you can see uh, Jupiter and Saturn and then probably uh, a couple of their moons. Uh, you can see some nebulas and things like that. Um, really interesting. We have open nights on Fridays, um, I think around seven, seven or eight, whenever it gets dark. And uh, we'll have grad students or undergrads here uh, to show you how the telescopes work. You guys can suggest uh, objects to look at, and then they'll just type them in and point at the sky. We, you can take pictures of nebulas and things like that. Um, really interesting. And uh, here on the right, you see like the two 20 inch telescopes we use. Uh, and this one on the left is the one uh, over here behind us. And then the dome over here is the 24 inch telescope. That, that's the one we use for uh, research, typically for uh, undergrad research. Um, and it's a lot older than, than the, the telescopes we have here. So uh, I think it, it's a little bit more interesting to look through the, uh, the ones on the right. But yeah, thank you for coming. And um, if no one has any more questions, we will end the presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Oh, I think we're good, right? Mm -hmm.